Distinguished heads of state and government, your excellencies, dear partners and members of the World Economic Forum, dear participants and friends, a very warm welcome to all of you to the opening of the Davos Agenda Week. I'm delighted that such a great global audience is joining us today, bringing together key leaders from politics, business, and all aspects of society. 2021 is a pivotal year, decisive in so many ways to shape our future. 2021 will be the critical year to re-establish trust in our ability to shape our common future in collective and constructive ways. We must win the fight against the virus. We must reinvigorate global economic growth and make it more robust, more resilient, more inclusive, and more sustainable. And at the same time, we must accelerate the transition to a net zero economy. In view of this objective, it's my distinct honor and great privilege to introduce our opening speaker of the Davos Agenda Week, His Excellency Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China. Mr. President, we all remember your historic speech in Davos in 2017. And unfortunately, in the last four years, the world has become in many ways even more interconnected, even more interdependent, but at the same time, more fractured and more polarized. Polarization has created the age of disagreement, which threatens to derail humanity. Now, we must come together to ensure that we capture the moment and move into the age of collaboration to build a better world. Mr. President, I could mention many initiatives that China has undertaken in the spirit of creating a world where all actors assume a responsible and responsive role. Mr. President, I believe this is the best time to reset our policies and to work jointly for a peaceful and prosperous world. We all welcome now His Excellency Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China. Professor Klaus Schwab, ladies and gentlemen, friends, the past year was marked by the sudden onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic. Global public health faced severe threat, and the world economy was mired in deep recession. Humanity encountered multiple crises rarely seen in human history. The past year also bore witness to the enormous resolve and courage of people around the world in battling the deadly coronavirus. Guided by science, reason and a humanitarian spirit, the world has achieved initial progress in fighting COVID-19. That said, the pandemic is far from over. The recent resurgence in COVID cases reminds us that we must carry on the fight. Yet we remain convinced that winter cannot stop the arrival of spring, and darkness can never shroud the light of dawn. Those are some fabulous presidential words. Sorry, guys, for the long intro there uh, without me saying a thing because there is a lot to be said and heard there. I've played this before. This is Xi Jinping's address to the World Economic Forum uh, that just happened January 25th, 2021 in Davos. Here it is back in 2017. The uh, the illustrious Klaus Schwab just uh, mentioned and in, in Xi's amazing speech. And uh, there's a lot there, folks. There is a ton there. Like Schwab said, we, you know, talked about collaborating and collective thought and collectivism, and we must work together. All this is the underlying structures of one world government. So we are going to get into this. And uh, before we get into it, in case you are new to the channel, this is All Minus One, and I am Bill. Welcome. Please like, share, and subscribe. 
Uh, you don't have to hit that little notification bell that everyone tells you to do because I think that thing's stupid. Uh, in any case, I, I don't need any more notifications on any devices. That's all I know. But please do like, share, subscribe. Uh, try and help this channel grow. It has been growing slowly um, and steadily, but the way YouTube works, I gain subs and I lose subs. So if you do think you are subscribed, make sure that you are. I'm still a very, very tiny channel. And um, if not, you know, and you like what I'm presenting here or you like some of my other content, please go subscribe, guys. Help me grow so I can get this word out because the stuff I talk about is not usually what most everyone else is talking about. Um, you can also go find me on Locals at All Minus One. I am on Rumble, uh, PeerTube, where, where else? BitChute, even though I usually end up uploading to BitChute later because I upload and it won't upload. <laughs> I come back three days later, still hasn't uploaded, even though it said it did. Um, but uh, I do try or have been trying to keep up to date with that. Um, and of course, I have a subscribe star if anyone is inclined to donate. There is also a live show that I do at DLive and YouTube. It's a separate channel on YouTube called The Ends Justify the Memes. So anyways. All that is in the description. Let's get into the topic. And the topic is the the Chinese century. That is this century, the 21st century. And this is the last in a series of videos that I've made about this over the last two weeks, where I um, have been going into depth in some of the perspectives on this over the course of the last 15, 20 years or so. Some of it's a little bit prior to that. And how... Uh, basically nearsighted and obtuse that many people in the State Department and w within the federal government in general have been with the agendas of China and how they've helped prop this up. So if you like that, please go back to the previous series. I will probably link them at the end here, uh, but it's not hard to do a little search. I could put cards in here. I could do all that fun stuff. I'm not going to because I expect you to be an adult and go fish for yourself. I'm not going to bring you, you know, uh, a bunch of fish every single night. You got to go learn to go fish for yourself, folks. And that's one of the problems with our society right now is that everyone wants a handout and no one wants to do for themselves or to help out their neighbor who may need that help. And we need to stop asking for the government to do such things. So in any case, this right here is the century of humiliation. So I've talked about this in just about every video, but essentially this is the hundred years in which China had no power and fell from its grace of its 2000 year dynasties. And they had a, a large uh, empire for a very long time. It changed hands who was in control, but China had a lot of influence in the Eastern world. And, they are a bit bitter about that. So just to get you caught up again with what we've been talking about, and then I'm going to get into some other things. I'm going to bring up this article. This is from Common Sense and Ramblings in America. It's a little blog spot. Let's see. If my mouse is wanting to give me the business here again. This happens quite a bit. It says China's 100-year plan for world domination. I've written several articles and on uh Posting related to politics, a list of links have been provided at the bottom of this article for your convenience. This article will, however, address different aspects of the political events. In 1995, Michael Pillsbury, which I've talked about many a times in, in the last uh, three videos I made on this, uh, an expert on, on China who has worked with every U.S. president since Nixon and, ha and has, he writes, arguably had more access to Chinese military and intelligence establishment than any other Westerner. Uh, was reading an article written by three of the Chinese uh, preeminent military experts about new technologies that would contribute to the defeat of the United States. It was in this article that Pillsbury first saw the term assassin's mace, which referred to a weapon from the Chinese folklore that guarantees a small combatant victory over a larger one uh, and more powerful one. The article describes its goal, including electromagnetic combat superiority that would allow naval victory and tactical laser weapons that would be used first in anti-missile defense systems. They discuss jamming and destroying radar and various communication systems. So this is like par for the course for any imperial power, any sort of governmental power. Uh, the United States tends to put on this air of halting as, oh, how dare you want nuclear weapons? How dare you want the same kind of uh, armaments and tech that we have? Well, yeah, 
Yeah, because you might come over and do stuff to my nation. So uh, us in the United States, we don't really worry about that because we have the largest military in the world with the most advanced technology. Unfortunately for us, though, the uh, the standards are changing and the times are changing. And there are a lot of leftists within the military today since the Obama administration. And it's not going well, guys. It's not going well. So the tools might be there, but the mindset is not. In any case, let's keep going. In time, Pillsbury uh, began seeing the term Assassin's Mace with regularity in Chinese documents, the military context. He writes, Assassin's Mace refers to a set of ace, uh, asymmetric weapons that allow for inferior power to defeat a seemingly superior adversity by striking at an enemy's weakest point. And he says, in a sense, the book, A Hundred Years Marathon, is Pillsbury's uh, Mila Culpa. Looking back, it was painful, but it was also... Uh, Looking back, it was painful that I was so gullible. We often all are, you know, we grow up. Um, in any case, this guy wrote the book on it. And here's some more stuff in this article we could look at if you wanted. This is uh, from February 8th, 2015, China's secret plan to topple the U.S. as a world superpower and so forth. So how is that going to happen? is really what we're talking about. And what are these plans? And then I made a kind of addendum to this on Tuesday. It wasn't exactly about this topic, but it was about the caliphate and their 100-year plans. It was about Japan at one point had 100-year plans. And seemingly everyone has 100-year plans except for the United States. Our politicians don't talk about plans for decades to come. It's always about what's happening here and now. And that's because of the way that we've geared are thinking as a nation because they play on that from the individual aspect, even though we live in a hive mind collective. And I mean that as far as those who are putting out the information, putting out the zeitgeist, the propaganda, the narrative, right? We know that the Democrat party is the largest party in the world, has the most members. We know that they have the most power. They uh, are strongly influential in media, academia, and within Hollywood. So they own those institutions. They own all of essentially the spy agencies and, and all of the uh, extra constitutional organizations, policing organizations that are not uh, authorized in the Constitution. They, they control them, guys. We know that specifically, if anything told you anything about it, with all the stuff that happened with Trump and impeachment and... Um, the whole, <laughs> the whole Russia collusion scandal and whatever else we know that it's blatantly obvious. And if it's not obvious to you, it's because you are purposely willfully be, be, being blind. You have, uh, a, a, a backfire effect based on the information that came out or some sort of confirmation bias that makes you just dis dismiss the information that comes out. And, if not that, then you probably have a normalcy bias thing. Well, it can't happen here. It can't happen here. That's the most stupid, absurd, naive thing you could possibly think and say. It can't happen here. Of course, it can happen here. Liberty must be guarded at all costs. It is a precious commodity that is easily stripped and taken away. Just look at history. It is filled with tyrants and despots. Liberty, my friends, is fleeting and has been just just a, a very minute portion of history. And if you want liberty, you must fight for it one way or another, preferably with your voice in your voice alone. So here from Yahoo News, it says, Border Patrol stopped the Chinese biologist carrying viable SARS-MERS virus at Detroit Airport in 2018. Now, this article came out March 30th, 2020. That was about this time a year ago, and it was about when people were starting to get concerned with the COOF and lockdowns were beginning to be put into place. It says U.S. Customs and Border Protection agent in Detroit Metro Airport stopped a Chinese scientist carrying vials believed to have contained MERS and SARS viruses in November 2018, just over a year before the first reported Wuhan uh, cases, according to the FBI tactical intelligence report obtained. 
inspection of the writing on the vials and the stated recipient led uh, inspection personnel to believe that materials contained within the vials may be viable Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which was SARS was in Asia, MERS was in the Middle East, guys, pretty much as simple as that. Uh, both had uh, much higher rates of death, about 10%. Uh, with infection, not the uh, 999.1 or 9% survival rate that we are facing now, although they were uh, not as spread as easily, supposedly. I'm not sure how much the COOF spreads easily either, though, given that uh, the, the mask studies and mask compliance comparisons, uh, again, have videos on that kind of stuff. Uh, doesn't seem to square that circle that they they, they want to make about the uh, most deadly virus ever uh, that we are in the midst of a pandemic of. In any case, it says the vials were labor, labeled antibodies and unnamed scientist said that he was asked to deliver them to researchers in the, in, at a U.S. institute. Now, this we can go through this whole thing. Doesn't really matter. At one point, initially, the customs picked up this guy in 2018. He was like, I didn't know what it was. Okay. This has happened repeatedly. There are ties. I didn't bring up any articles here, but there are ties that you can find very easily. If you guys just go out there and fish a little bit for yourself between Dr. Fauci and the Wuhan level four Institute lab. Now the Wuhan lab, my friends, I'm not saying that that is where the current uh, pandemic we are facing has come from, but it seems very likely. And that theory is getting more and more prominent in the media. But the media has been doing, uh, you know, cover for Wuhan. Like the Washington Post released this whole video on YouTube about how oh, it was impossible for it to come from Wuhan. Uh, the comments section was quite lit on that as everyone was like, no, screw you guys, you're totally wrong. In any case, um, I know for a fact, because I do get some inside information on occasion, um, just because I have certain connections through uh, certain people, including my my uh, my wife, that uh, this has been, this was defunded uh, actually through her, her work and... Uh, Congressman Matt Gates, but then it was refunded through another program. That is the Wuhan lab folks. And now it was just defunded again by the U S and mark my words, there will be some sort of federal spending budget at some point. There will be some sort of bill somewhere down the line. Wuhan will be funded by us again because this is a shell game guys. It always is. In any case, Fauci has, uh, links to Wuhan, because we don't really do gain of function studies here anymore. And if you don't know what that is, that's to make super viruses so they can learn how to kill super viruses and, and, and doing the super virus thing. Essentially, they make these things that are unnatural and hard to kill. And if they escape can be very, very dangerous. It's just a dumb way of going about things. As I often make the analogy, it's like saying you have a schoolyard bully and you go to your schoolyard bully and you go, well, I want to know how to beat you up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you go to MMA classes five days a week. I'm going to have you do some powerlifting and um, whatever else. I'm going to give you some roids. I'm going to put you in a really strict diet and um, I'm going to do none of that. But I'm going to see if I can beat you up in six months. <laughs> and then after six months and when you get your butt kicked, you go, okay, now, now I'm going to do the stuff you were doing. Well, the guy's got a six month lead on you and he was already your bully. So uh, it, it's just dumb. It's, it, it's dumb to make monsters of things that, that aren't monsters in the first place. And uh, most coronaviruses are not. Most of them are uh, easily gotten over by human beings, the ones that we get. So also from uh, Yahoo, it says... Chinese researcher accused of trying to smuggle vials of biological material out of U.S. hidden uh, in a sock. Wow. So this was uh, 2019. Chinese medical researcher was arrested in Boston earlier this month on suspicion of trying to take a stolen biological sample back to China, according to an affidavit by the FBI agent. According to agent's testimony published with redactions on Universal Hub, a community news and information site, for the Boston area, Zhang Zhaozong, a 29-year-old, was questioned at Logan International Airport on December 9th. So again, this gets into that. This has happened numerous times over the years, folks. 
It just continues to happen. So, from March 30th, 2020, suspected SARS virus and flu samples found in luggage, FBI reports, describes Chinese biosecurity risk. In late November 2018, just over a year before, the COOF, and this is what I was talking to you about earlier. So it is out here. Here is the unclassified U.S. Department of Justice memo on this. And then here we have former Harvard affidavit. This is uh, the uh, the crimson.com, by the way, Harvard Crimson. Former half a David affiliated researcher pleads guilty to lying about smuggled cancer research. And this was uh, the same person I just mentioned, not the one from 2018, but the one that was arrested at the Boston airport. And supposedly he was a good Samaritan of some sorts. A former researcher at the Harvard affiliated Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center pledged, pled guilty in federal court Thursday to lying to customs officials about charges. He tried to smuggle cancer research into China. Zhang, a 31-year-old who arrived in the United States from China in 2018, was arrested on December 10th, 2019 at a Boston Logan International Airport. Customs officials found 21 vials of biological material in a sock packed in his suitcase, which allegedly came from a lab at Beth Israel where he worked. It says the false statement with charges come with a potential of up to five years in prison and a $250,000 fine. As part of the plea deal, the false statement charges, prosecutors agreed to drop the charges of smuggling goods out of the country. <laughs> yeah. Customs officials have fled uh, Zhang as a higher risk for smuggling biological material, yada, yada, yada. Who cares? In any case, the guy pled guilty. And this guy's happens all the time, but you never see it on your mainstream media. Uh, you never see it on your MSNs or your CNNs or your Fox News. You don't see it. Now, don't get me wrong. On occasion, you might see like Tucker Carlson cover something like this. I haven't watched Tucker in months, so I could not tell you. But uh, he does cover stuff like that on occasion. He is probably one of the better legacy media pundits. And guys, I will often say a lot of you folks don't like punditry. I am obviously doing punditry. Punditry is a good thing. I know people say, well, I don't like punditry. I just want print. When you just read print, here's the problem. You never get an opinion and a perspective on what you're reading. That's not to say you cannot make up your own opinion or perspective. But if you are in an echo chamber of your own head... You will just agree with yourself about what that article says versus if you get about a dozen different people having different perspectives, you're going to get a clearer sense of what things might be as long as you're open minded to it. Punditry is actually a very important tool. You just have to understand that you can't pick one person to be your Lord and Savior, right? I'm not here to tell you guys. This is the way you need to think. This is exactly how you think. What I'm here to do is say, here's information. This is what I think about it. This is how I see the world. Agree or disagree, but I'm pretty sure it's the way it's going because I keep being right about stuff. Just saying. So there is a time where I will be wrong. <laughs> I have been wrong. Look, the lockdown thing, I should have seen coming from a mile away as far as it lasts in this long, and I didn't quite see that. Now, maybe because at the time I, I was concerned with other things in my life, and I didn't have my eye on the ball, right? My fault. And that's the thing is we are all blind in certain areas. And that's where pundits can come in and help you out. Use them wisely, though. Understand that we are all human beings. We all have our blind spots. But some folks can point you in certain directions. I'll tell you what punditry did for me on things like Section 230 is it made me realize, oh, the Internet's actually just like a phone service. It's a public utility. Hadn't thought that way before. And I had to think it through. I didn't just, oh, well, no, I agree with that statement. I had to think about it. And you know what? The people that were saying that, they were right. It's true. <laughs> In any case, let's keep moving. So this is from the, um, from the South China Morning Post. And again, I'm just going to read the highlights here. I just want you guys to know it's easy to find this information. You can go find it yourself. Exclusive. More Chinese nationals. Searched at U.S. Customs government data shows U.S. border agents carried out 1,147 searches of Chinese nationals' electronic devices in 2019, a rise of 66% from the previous year data shows. Now, this is still under Trump, of course. 
hard to say if any of this will change, uh, given that the DOJ is now under Biden. The increased searches coincide with the Justice Department's launch of its Chinese initiative or China initiative in November 2018, targeting uh, suspected theft of trade secrets, which they do all of the time. This was Mar or, sorry, August of 2020. And guys, um, searches of Chinese citizens' laptops, smartphones, and other electronic devices, the U.S. border increased by two-thirds last year. Da, 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 da. Anyways, you can go through this. I'm not going to go through um, the article just because I got a bunch of articles today and I got a bunch of stuff to talk about. But it's happening. It's happening on grand scale. And so is the espionage. So is the intellectual property rights being stolen. And so is the buildup of the Chinese military. And you have to understand that they are the ones who are about to be the world's superpower. I can't tell you when this will be, but likely their goal is the hundred year goal is by 2049. And I would say likely they will be there, but by 2030, America will be dwindling significantly, especially if we are on a full on hot civil war. Um, it, it, it's going to be a wild time. So this is from the Justice Department directly. This is their actual official page. And this is from the District of Massachusetts because this is where this happened at. Harvard University professor and two Chinese nationals charged with three separate China-related cases. Boston, U.S. attorney uh, official announced today that the chair of Harvard University's chemistry and chemical biological department and two Chinese nationals have been charged in connection with aiding the People's Republic of China. Dr. Charles Lieber, 60, chair of the Department of Chemistry and, and uh, Chemical Biology at Harvard University, was arrested this morning and charged by criminal complaint with one count of making a uh, materially false, fictitious, and fraudulent statement. Lieber will um, appear this afternoon before magistrate judge, yeah, who cares? Um, Yang Queen Yi, 29, a Chinese national, was charged in, in an um, indictment today with one count each of visa fraud, making false statements, actions, yada, yada, yada. And then the other one was the guy that we just read about. Now, I covered Dr. Lieber months ago when the story was breaking. Um, I want you to also remember Fang Fang. Remember Fang Fang and Eric Smallwell? Eric Smallwell, who is on the, uh, the, 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 the uh, intelligence, the House Intelligence Committee and the federal government. Had a Chinese honeypot. Guys, this is all over the world, but very much in the United States. If this stuff happens with uh, U.S. nationals in China, by the way, folks, they disappear. <laughs> Just like Chinese billionaires disappear. From the New York Times, stolen research, Chinese scientist is accused of smuggling lab samples. Again, I didn't make any of this up and I uh, had planned to take stolen samples to Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hospital, which I would assume is in Taiwan. If you know anything about the history and divide of the Taiwanese and the, uh, the CCP in, in the mainland China. So this is uh, JD Supra, Charles Lieber, Feng Tao and DOJ's ongoing search for Chinese spies at U.S. research institutions. That's February 2020. Last month, yet another decorated academic from a prestigious American research institute found himself in the crosshairs of a criminal inquiry stemming from an alleged undisclosed affiliation with Chinese institutions. Uh, this guy, by the way, was getting hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know if these articles cover that, but like I said, I have talked about it in the past. The guy was getting quite rich from China. On January 28, 2020, federal agents arrested Professor Charles uh, Lieber, chair of the Harvard University Chemistry and uh, Chemical Biology Department. Like this guy was the head of Harvard. Harvard. You remember the Barry Weiss article from the other day that caused a little bit of an uproar. I covered it on a quick shot. Um, guys, your institutions are corrupt. Why are you sending your children there? 
Stop thinking global, reset, go back to local. Don't go back to monkey. I know the meme. <laughs> I'm the master of the memes. I Look, guys, don't go back to monkey. Go back to local. Local is where it's at. Know your sheriff's department. Know your local city if you are in one or town or whatever. Me, I'm in a community. I'm not in a a, uh, a town. I'm not affiliated. I live out in, in, in a rural area. Um, in any case, though, but know your neighbors. Know what is going on with the folks around you and stop worrying about folks on the other side of the world that have never met you and if need be because they thought it was the right thing would smoke you in a second. And I mean that in the military sense, guys, because they absolutely would. They don't care about you. You're just a number. You're just a debt slave. You're just a, a tax cattle is what you are to those folks. I can promise you if that wasn't true, they wouldn't have just basically taxed you for, you know, almost six grand to give you, um, <laughs> give you just over a thousand back. And you start thinking in proper perspective and start thinking about what your government does. As we previously commented, Professor Lieber is neither the first academic to face criminal charges, nor is he likely to be the last given the Department of Justice intense focus on non-traditional collectors an American research institution and universities. On February 6, federal prosecutors from across the country uh, forecast a busy year of persecutions involving prosecutions, excuse me, involving those suspects of acting as agents of the Chinese government. And um, yeah, the difference here was... Uh, under Obama, no one cared. Under Bush, no one cared. Under Trump, they cared. This is why Trump was the fascist, right? Because he's not a globalist. Makes no sense because fascist, at least in the Hitlerian sense, as they compared him constantly, were all about world domination. Maybe um, maybe not so much with uh, uh, Mussolini. Maybe not in, uh, Franco. But uh, the other fascists, yeah, there's German fascist. Unless you do not see my point. Anyways, <laughs> let's keep going, guys. Here we have, again, uh, Department of Justice. This one is not uh, Massachusetts. It's just the straight Department of Justice. Harvard University professor and two Chinese nationals charged in separate uh, related cases. Again, official sources are always good to go to primary sources, right? As U.S. Justice, this is from foreignpolicy.com. Sorry, as U.S. injustice rage, China's condemnation reeks of cynicism. This was last year during the height of the riots, June 5th. The protests across the United States triggered by the killing of George Floyd in police custody have inspired a wave of demonstrations around the globe. Protesters in Australia, Brazil, Germany, and the United Kingdom, and many other countries are gathered en masse to denounce racism and police violence in the United States because they are all sheeple, non-autonomous people, completely persona. They wear their outer mask on. They have not developed their inner beings. Stuff I haven't talked about in a while, but I should get back to. Look, guys. People were protesting American police brutality and tearing down things in the UK, an area that does not have the issues we have here in the US and certain cities with that. Why would they do such a thing? Could it be because of the global mind virus of collectivism, the communistic way? I would say so. Amidst the global support for the U.S., Black Lives Matter movement is an unusual new ally. The Chinese government. Why is that unusual? That's perfectly on par. Why does China want us to succeed when they have a 100-year plan to be the global leaders? The People's Daily, the Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece, published a cartoon portraying the White House tainted in blood and covered in tear gas standing on top of a crumbling statue of liberty. As they oppress the minorities of, in, in uh, Hong Kong and the, the Uyghurs and uh, Tibet and fight with Taiwan. Yeah, yeah, you got a lot of room to talk, China. A lot of room to talk. Anyways, revealing the true identity as police officer Neon on George Floyd Neck, da, 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 which is Chauvin's in trial for right now. Um, and other people will cover that guy because I don't really care about it. And yeah, there'll be some rioting, but it's not going to be like it was before because Orange Man is out. The current situation reflects 
once more the severity of the problems of racism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who cares? Huei uh, Chunging, known for their aggressive pushback against foreign criticism of Chinese handling of the coup, Uyghur concentration camps, and brutal police violence against Hong Kong protesters. Let's not forget their initial lockdown attempts with the uh, the coup. They were locking people in their homes and welding them in and then coming back a month later and finding them dead. Let's not forget that. I know it's been a year and, and, and you know, Americans are uh, generally not able to remember anything I past last week, but maybe just people in general, right? But uh, that did happen, guys. Beijing's criticism of the United States, however, differ from that seen around the globe. China's critique does not stem from a genuine concern for universal human rights and the well-being of African Americans. The Chinese people have not been given the opportunity to protest in solidarity with Americans or against the abuse of uh, black residents in China itself. Anti-black racism remains rampant on the Chinese Internet, no doubt. I mean, that's generally a thing in, in uh, Asia and, you know, you can travel a little bit. Black folks aren't seen well around most of the world, honestly. Um, I remember uh, I had a girlfriend years ago. It was Brazilian. And her grandfather was a black man. She's white as snow. But um, still, still, I guess her hair, you know, had like what the way like a lot of black people's hair is kind of very curly, and whatever. Um, very dark. Uh, in any case, but she's like, you know, quarter black or something. And um, she would talk about how racist the Brazilians were against blacks and her grandfather being a black man was racist against other black people. So um, this is, you know, kind of par for the course. Uh, you know, I've, I've read to you before uh, Race, Color, and Communism by Manning Johnson. And he talks about how he was invited to Russia and all. But Russians don't like blacks, folks. Just, it, you know, and I don't care what your skin color is, but uh, I'm just telling you that this, that, uh, this idea in America that we're super racist is just like absolutely absurd. Like you need to get outside of the country. <laughs> the end. That's all I'm going to talk and say about that. Um, says last Friday afternoon, Trump held a press conference and announced China's plan to uh, devise a national security law to crack down on Hong Kong dissidents. He threatened to end the U.S. recognition, recognition of Hong Kong's special trading status and the sanction of the Chinese of officials hurt Hong Kong's freedom. All right, sorry about that, guys. Just trying to get this. I'm wondering if you all can see it. Oh, lovely. I didn't know what happened there, guys. Ah, oh, just pop up. Okay. All right. So let's get back here to where we were at. The government just wrote recently in China, should it? Um, this says, such rhetoric has grown commonly over the last few years, a few decades, as Chinese Communist Party they gradually abandoned its appeal for more uh, just social systems and world order. Instead, the party has become increasingly explicit in referring to the global domination by Western powers as a license for its own imperial ambitions. Uh, Zhang Shigong, an influential official sc scholar who advised the Chinese government on Hong Kong policy and global governance, even wrote recently in sh that China should absorb the skills and achievement of the British and American empires to construct its own world empire for the sake of the Chinese people around the world. Now, interesting how I read to you again earlier in the series, there are some people going, oh, oh, oh no, the Chinese, they just want to become rich and they're not going to be like, Amer you know, there's a mistake that the Chinese aren't going to be like the American world police. They probably won't be, but I bet if they can economically enhance their standing they'll do military action that was the whole point of british imperialism in the first place of all imperialism of european um descent uh, that's what rome was doing way back in the day and actually that's what china was doing too what do you think the chinese empire was all about back in the day come on guys 
It says, for those in the United States uh, and elsewhere who aspire for more equality, justice, and liberty, it is a mistake to see Beijing as an exotic progressive force with which to ally. Beijing points to the violence and injustice of the United States to exonerate itself from its own egregious violence and injustice, of course. But, you know, we could go down along this and they love it. And the reason why they love it is because that is the left loves what Chinese that China does is because they're all authoritarians and just go read Mao and what he, what he talks about the revolution, people standing in his way. From the Heritage Foundation, this BLM co-founder and pro-communist China group are uh, partnering up. Here's why. Key takeaways. There has not been a peep from the media or Congress about China's support of the riots. It's true. I don't think I've heard anything or heard anything at the time about it, even though I was covering it on my tiny, tiny channel. The CPA was founded in San Francisco in 1972 during the heady days of the Marxist-oriented uh, Asian American movement. The communist China has put its vast propaganda apparatus to work in support of the mayhem that has wreaked havoc in America City this year. Imagine that far-right demonstrators were laying siege to America cities for months, led by activists explicitly calling for an ethno-state, and that uh, one of their groups was funded by an outfit involved with Vladimir Putin's Russia. Let's stop there. There's no one on the far-right calling for an ethno-state. Every one of those people I've ever met, you hear them talk, are talking about having a socialistic-style government. They are leftists. Maybe there are people on the right that are saying that, I don't know, but what do you call right? Because if we're looking at the it in perspective of the left-right paradigm that was set up basically since the French Revolution, the revolutionaries are on the left. So anyone who's a revolutionary is a leftist automatically. And anyone who's trying to uphold the, the, the position of power that has been established is on the right. And anyone who wants to go back is a reactionary. I want to go back to the Constitution and to the ways of the 1800s, the early 1800s before the Civil War. That makes me technically a reactionary in today's terms. No, I'm not a neo-reactionary. I just think of myself as liberty-minded. I really don't care about all this governmental stuff anymore because they're going to do what they want to do. They always have. What I care about are people, you folks, and building strong societies and keeping a remnant and a tradition alive of what is good. Because once they burn all the books, someone eventually is going to have to come out and say, hey, I still have books. I still have knowledge. Let me re-educate you. It says, uh, and rightly so, the threat of foreign interference in our domestic affairs is a serious matter. Whether the suspects are rivals such as Russia or uh, friendlies such as Mexico, these are. this is especially the case of foreign powers were uh, abetting unrest and abating arrest that uh, aims to topple our constitutional order. Well, the scenario described above is happening, though not with Russia or the far right, but with China and the leftist disturbance upending America and seeking to transform it. And again, it goes through here. It talks about um, founder Alicia Garza, how you donate, History of the Chinese Progressive Association. The CPA was founded in San Francisco in 1972 during the heady days of the Marxist-oriented Asian American movement. And today it is all, also has a very uh, active chapter in Boston. It's funny how Boston keeps coming up here. Boston, Boston. What's going on in Boston, guys? Be wary of what the Atlantic prints, folks. That's all I'm going to tell you about Boston. Um... And I know I have some uh, Massachusetts who watch me regularly, Mister uh, Mister Boot too. <laughs> Anyways, according to a, an authoritative, uh, or sorry, is that Boot too? No, it's not Boot too. That's uh, that's another guy. Sorry, got you guys confused. I both spoke to both of you the other day, but either way, hey, 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 getting confused here. According to authoritative 2009 Stanford University paper, 
tracing its early days to a, to the present, and which can be found on Marxist.org, the CPA began as a leftist pro-People's Republic of China organization promoting awareness of mainland China's revolution, or sorry, revolutionary thought and workers' rights, and dedicated to self-determination, community control, and serving the people. The CPA continues the paper working, or sorry, worked with other pro uh, PRC groups within the U.S. and San Francisco Bay Area. So support of the PRC was based on the inspiration of members drew from what they saw as an unsuccessful grassroots model that uh, presented a viable alternative to Western capitalism. There is no alternative to free markets, guys, except for tyranny. One of the ways it did uh, this was by holding film screens that were open to the public, sometimes showing Chinese films as well as facilitate understanding. Yeah, yeah, it's just they're trying to get propaganda in, right? In 97, the, uh, the Boston sponsors raised the PRC's flag for the first time ever in the Boston City Hall to honor the takeover of China by the Chinese Communist Party, just as Stanford paper says has been the CPA's practice from the beginning. So they celebrated this. They like it. It doesn't matter, by the way, folks, it doesn't matter to the leftist what's actually done. It only matters about, like to them, it only literally matters about names and language and, and words. This is the problem with ideologies. They're not principled. They, it only matters about power and who, what, what, what words do you use? I misspeak all the time. I was just mentioning a viewer who I just spoke to the other day and I uh, confused him with another one. Guys, it, it, it's just merely human to misspeak or to, to say the wrong thing or for your brain to, to cut out for a minute. But these people, they, are, they care very much about that because it's not about thinking. It's not about free thought or a flow of thought. It's about control and indoctrination always. And so it doesn't matter if the Chinese Communist Party is actually involved in some form of a fascistic uh, rule or has some sort of free markets, even though there's not really supposed to be in communism. They're communist by name. Therefore, they are good. Just like it didn't matter that Che Guevara murdered, you know, thousands of people, tens of thousands, that he was anti-gay and anti-black. doesn't matter. The left still make excuses for him because he was a revolutionary trying to prop up the people. It's all about the words and it's all about the ideology. It's never about their actions. It's, it's a really interesting thing. Um, on a side note, I would say the same thing about false Christians or anyone who's in a religion who says that they're in some sort of religion, some sort of faith, and they don't live up to those actions. Now, we all fail in our actions, folks. That's not the same thing. I'm talking about saying that you're a certain thing when you do everything by your behavior that states otherwise. What you believe is what you act out. It's not what you say. We, I can say all kinds of things that are merely lies, right? It's what I act out. It's how I live. That That's what shows you the, the character of the individual. And to the leftists, they don't care about any of that. They only care about what you say. You understand? Maybe that will help you understand cancel culture and the cult of the left a little bit better. So here it says, uh, those events now take place in some regularity. Chinese consul general... Uh, traveling to New York was on hand at a similar event in Boston in 2014. The common interests are far more important than the differences between the U.S. and China. That is the globalist interest. Susan Lee, a co-founder of the CPA Boston, also spoke at the 2014 event, noting her efforts to promote better U.S.-Chinese relations. The Chinese flag-raised event in 2019 marked the 50th anniversary of the communist takeover of China uh, drew protest. And it goes on, it talks about their, uh, their movement, and then it talks about Black Lives Matter and the opposition to capitalism. And it's clear then that the CPA Boston works with Chinese Communist government, pushes its agenda here in the United States, as CPA San Francisco does, and that both CPA chapters are regularly praised by Chinese state-owned mouthpieces. It is clear, too, from this perspective, why the CPA would sponsor a new enterprise by uh, Garza. They espouse the same desire for world communism. 
Garza sits on top a world revolutionary empire started by the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, which now has 15 chapters in the U.S. Uh, and all over Canada, Australia, and Europe. What a bunch of garbage. Good Lord. By the way, there was a nonprofit, if you were not aware, that was called Black Lives Matter, started by a man many years ago that um, was about getting ba basically youth and other people in the community involved with the police and them working together to to quell police brutality had been making all kinds of money through like GoFundMe and stuff and then GoFundMe stopped that took that money and gave it to Black Lives Matter the the communist activist group who has been getting money funneled through uh, Act Blue by the way to the Democrat Party imagine that guys leftists control the world you need to get your head around that right now I, you really do the leftists control everything and they will probably always, um, you know, some people might not agree with me, but uh, it, it's not about beating them per se. It's about maintaining, in my opinion, it's about continuing on regardless, despite of the, the, uh, the obstacles. And this has been the struggle of humankind, guys, the struggle against tyranny. Garza is also behind the movement for Black Lives Matter with its 50 domestic organizations. In July, she said, we helped to also pull together an ecosystem that um, that was much broader than the organization that we founded. And the ecosystem is called the Movement for Black Lives Matter, and it's taking the world by storm. Movement for Black Lives Matter is unbelievably, un unabashedly anti-capitalist, saying on its website, we're anti-capitalist, we believe in, um, and understand that the black people will never achieve liberation under the current global racialized capitalist system that is antithetical to what actually would happen actually under free markets you would be free under communism you'll just be enslaved but you know mind virus so it's not possible for the world to emerge where black lives matter if it's not if it's under capitalism why why do you think slavery is better? This is just a, by the way, a rehashing of the Black Panthers. Um, and, and these people just don't understand reality. They also talked about getting rid of the family. Um, you know, this is a rehashing of Plato's Republic, really. Come on, guys. Like, this is very old. The role of Black Future Labs. Anyways, it continues. This article goes on. I am going to go over an hour today, it looks like. But I got a lot more to show you. So this is 2017. This is about right. Uh, China's 30-year plan roadmap to take over the U.S. and dominate the world with military built for war. And guys, this is express.co.uk. She warned of severe challenges ahead, but said the Chinese will become, or China will become, more and more open. See if that helps. It says he, there'll be a model for the whole of mankind by 2050. Now, do you want China and the things that they have done with the Tibetans, with Hong Kong recently, uh, their ongoing battle with Taiwan, they've been at uh, some uh, border skirmishes with India lately, the Uyghur camps. Uh, all of the stuff that they do to prop themselves up, the the uh, great leap forward, the great famine, all the stuff that's happened in, in recent Chinese history in the last hundred years, not even hundred years. Do you really want them to be the model for all of humankind with things like the social credit score and whatnot? He told delegates, by 2050, China will have become a global leader in terms of comprehensive national strength and international influence with the rule of law, uh, innovative companies, a clean environment, and expanding middle class, adequate public transportation, and reduced disparities between urban and rural areas. Uh, I don't see that being likely with the U.S. in place, but the U.S. is about to fall. Chinese people will enjoy greater happiness. He declares victory over many difficult, long overdue problems since he took power in 2012 and is president for life, by the way. Right now, both China and the world are in the midst of a profound and complex change. China is still an important period of strategic opportunity for development. Prospects are very bright, but the challenges are 
very severe. That gives a Trump quote. I've developed a friendship. Of course, you. yeah, yeah. We'd want Biden to say the same thing if Biden wasn't bought and paid for by the Chinese and he wouldn't be like, well, that Uyghur thing, I'm not really going to address it because it's just different cultures to genocide of people. <laughs> oh, man, he's the best. This might actually be, this. this is, after Trump, Honestly, Biden might be the cherry on top of uh, of ridiculousness within the federal government. It's, it's, it is quite amusing. Um, outlined China's place in the world. He called for a strong military, but said he wanted to avoid a conflict with the U.S. president uh, over North Korea. Xing said the Communist Party will strive to fully transform the People's Liberation Army into one, the world's top military by 2015, or sorry, 2050, and emphasize the need for uh to modernize its combat capability, which they are doing. So, from national interest, this is China's plan to overtake America as the next superpower. Again, you can read about that. This is back to the uh, Department of Justice official website. Information about the Department of Justice China Initiative and a compilation of Chinese-related prosecutions since uh, 2018. About 80% of all economic... All economic espionage prosecutions brought by the U.S. Department of Justice allege conduct that would benefit the Chinese state and there is at least some nexus to China in around 60% of all trade secret theft cases. By the way, folks, I meant to bring up an article. I forgot about it. I can Google search real quick, but I'm not going to because I have plenty to talk about. The, the, the Chinese were far more influential in that, that, that uh, Russia collusion, uh, voter uh, manipulation thing than Russia ever was. There were way more Chinese servers than Russia ever had. Again, I've covered this before. They were far more involved in, in election manipulation. But you know who was really the most involved? Well, big tech was. Big tech was the most involved with that kind of stuff. And of course, we know that over in the, the land uh, of the Far East, they have... Uh, this troubling new social credit system. This goes all the way back to 2015. This is from the New Republic. Here we have China's social credit score. Beijing sets up huge system from BBC. Here from Business Insider. China has started raking citizens with a creepy social credit score. This is 2018. Here's Vox from 2018. Here is Wired, the complicated truth about Ch Chinese social credit score China's social credit system isn't a world uh isn't a world first but when it is a uh completed it'll be unique a system isn't just as simple as everyone being given a score though okay fair enough and then we have this which I covered in the first video uh Chinese plan to boost masculinity with PE classes sparks debate they uh they want to get rid of their femboys they see that raising up strong Chinese men is important I'm not for collectivism. I'm not for centralization. But if you're going to do it, man, do it this way. Because what's going on in our culture is devastating. Here's another interesting article. This is from Inside Higher ED. Uh, reconsidering the China Initiative. Arrest of MIT professor Gang Chen puts a spotlight on the Department of Justice controversy and China Initiative. It is making major cases out of major issues. It is, or is it ethnic profiling? March 2nd, 2021, of course, being um, higher education, it's going to talk about ethnic profiling and whatever else. But I wanted to bring it up in that this is recent, guys. This was 10 days ago as of the recording of this. This is March 12th today that I'm recording it, 2021. And... Um, There are more people being arrested for Chinese spying and, you know, we can go through all that, whatever. Chinese banks, guys, we can go. Here's just a wiki. You can look this up, uh, numerous sources, but top banks of the world were the first four Chinese. You look at the top 20, 
Uh, the U.S. ain't covering a lot, guys. Not covering a lot. Comparatively. And uh, Japan's not far behind. And, of course, we've got the U.K. and France in there. But a lot of Chinese banks. And within the top 100, man, China dominates hardcore. Again, I've spoke about this before. We need to know where we're at. Here we have the World Economic Forum once again. Harnessing the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Option 1, Davos Agenda. And I just want to read to you from this little description here. It says, Fourth Industrial Revolution technologies driven by artificial intelligence are expected to fundamentally change the world. In a recent survey, 63% of CEOs said they believe that AI will have a larger impact on the Internet. This leadership panel examines how industries and governments can work with partnerships to unlock the potential of the fourth industrial revolution technology for the benefit of all stakeholders in 2021. They say stakeholders, again, that's kind of like coded language. That is the dog whistle of the left um, or the globalist. He would just say, you know, of humanity, if it wasn't humanity, he's saying stakeholders, he means shareholders. He means people who are, who are at least maybe not direct shareholders, but are the rich that are the elite. That's what he's talking about. He uses that terminology to make you think he's talking about all the, well, it's the stakeholders. It's the people that spend their money. Um, but I know it's not that because he says stakeholder capitalism. Well, everyone is a stakeholder in the free market. As far as where you spend your money at, you are voting with your dollar. So everything else that he talks about, all the collectivism he talks about, all the stuff he talks about, uh, that is Klaus Schwab with the, uh, or his organization with, um, basically the governments of the 20th century were too liberal, too liberal, too free compared to what dude, are you serious? The 20th century was the greatest century ever in human history of democide, the murder of people by governments, the government's own people. Schwab is a madman. But I do want to highlight the speakers here because they, they, there are quite a few of them that are um, Chinese, Chinese nationals. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone online. Uh, welcome to this John session, John Slate, developed by a World Economic Forum and Yitai Media Group. Uh, my name is Yan Qingyang. It is my great pleasure to moderate this session, harnessing the fourth industrial revolution. Comparable with the steam engine, electricity, internet, and the uh, IBC in the... So I, 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 got, I want you guys just to understand this, that the, 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 the Chinese nationals are leading this conversation in the World Economic Forum. And again, who are the Uyghurs and why is the U.S. accusing China of genocide? What's happening with the Uyghurs in China from PBS? And I like this. This is from the India Times. Rape, intermittent camps, internment camps, sorry. Uh -huh. Mass sterilization, how China is committing genocide of the Uyghurs. Yeah, yeah, I got an ad blocker. And interestingly... Uh, if you weren't aware, there was some skirmishes on the border from 20 to 2021. Uh, China, India skirmish. This was a thing where they claimed the Indians that the Chinese used microwave weapons on them. That goes back to the Michael Pillsbury article uh, about the uh, whatever the mace is called that he mentions in the article. I can't recall. Let's see if I can find it real quick here. The Assassin's Mace. Okay. So, um, whoop, didn't mean to jump that far ahead. But anyways, so here we have uh, what's behind the Chinese-Taiwan divide. And if you don't know, this goes all the way back to the origins of China. Taiwan being an island nation of itself, but being technically part of the People's Republic. And it goes over the history and all of that. But the, uh, the KMT was a different group that was considered right-wing or is considered right-wing by the by the, the, the smooth brains that think they have big brains uh, out there in academia. Uh, I, they, they weren't really right-wing, but they were nationalists, therefore right-wing. Um, so anyways, they operated off the three principles of the people, and that was pretty much the uh, 
the philosophy to make China free, prosperous, and a powerful state. And that's about as far as I'm going to get into that. You can read into the KMT yourself. Uh, Sun Yat-sen developed this. This is, I mentioned earlier in the uh, description here. Why are there protests in Hong Kong? All the context you need. Okay, well, again, I've covered this plenty of times. We know why. They are supposed to be free, and China has come to take them over. And, uh, oh, yeah, I have one last little little snippet here out of nowhere. This is China cuts carbon intensity by 18.8% in the past five years in an effort to rein in its emissions. Although it emits like 50% of all emissions in the globe. <laughs> so <laughs> this is nothing, guys. It's absolutely nothing. In any case, oh, what is the point of all this? Why am I showing you, man? Uh, why am I showing you this? Why am I showing you all this stuff? Because you have to understand the actual power and might and influence that China has. You have to understand that the United States is currently losing in its world power. Now, it may not seem that way, but look at how much disarray our government is in, how much uh, waking up our, our culture is coming too, right? We, we're, we're having so many people day after day realizing, wow, most of what I have thought and been taught has been a bunch of nonsense. Wow, the government really isn't taking care of me. And I know people have believed this for a long time, but not for the normies, right? And the normies need to wake up. The normies don't know about the espionage. They don't know about the intellectual property rights being taken. They don't know about the Harvard pro professor's uh, essentially taking, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars annually to, for trade secrets. They don't know about the Feng Fangs and then the Eric Smallwells who are on the, um, intelligence committees, right? They don't know about the Uyghurs. They don't know about Tibet. They don't know about Hong Kong. The normies only watch legacy media. And what is legacy media telling you about? Orange man bad. Now, orange man isn't around. I don't know what they're talking about. How great Joe Biden is. I mean, okay. We have a senile president that's doing business as usual for the globalist. The The legacy media is saying, oh, the World Economic Forum isn't a conspiracy. It's not. Because it seemed like that all of the big CEOs of the world and governments are getting together and collaborating and talking I might need to look up what the word conspiracy means, but I'm pretty sure that's all it means. It doesn't mean anything else. And uh, folks like uh, Tim Pool get this wrong all the time because he, he that's a standalone complex. It's a, It looks like a conspiracy, but it's a standalone complex. No, Tim, it's really not. They've been talking about this crap for over 100 years. They write about it uh, quite openly, talk about it openly. I mean, uh, George Orwell talked about it. H.G. Wells talked about it. Alex Huxley. Um, those are just some some uh, minds, but they're not the only ones. George Bernard Shaw, um, I don't know, just certain people I can think of off the top of my head. Of course, the Rockefellers have been pushing this stuff for a long time. We know that the bankers want world banking. Guys, FDR liked this idea. Woodrow Wilson wanted a League of Nations. It's the reason why the United States got into World War II. Probably wouldn't have been a second world war if we hadn't done such a thing. The League of Nations was the predecessor to what we have today as the UN. Now, is that governing body that powerful? No, but they are as as powerful as the military might is. The UN covers for China all of the time. Go look at UN uh, corruption and you will find that there are board members of the UN who would not place certain sanctions or would not do certain things for China because they were getting their pockets lined. This should all be kind of a moot point. It shouldn't be anything I need to talk about for an hour. But apparently I do because not a lot of people are. Not a lot of people are talking about this. And not a lot of people are saying, very specifically like I am, China is going to be the new global power very soon. The United States dollar is about to be destroyed. The yuan is going to be the world currency. And all of us here in the West are about to have a really, really bad time. And with their social credit score and all the things that they have done, big tech will support them as we have seen now. Hollywood will support them as we are seeing now. Um, the NBA 
will support them as we are seeing now. It doesn't matter, folks, because the almighty dollar to these people is what is most important to these folks in charge. They get to maintain their power. They get to maintain their wealth, even though everyone here in the United States might be hurting. And then they get to pretend and have platitudes with their virtue signals that they're good folks. And they get to preach down from on high because they're rich and part of that inner circle, how you are a deplorable. No, I don't think so. And I'm just opting out. I'm just getting out of the whole system, frankly. And uh, it's still possible today. And the United States is quite a big person or big person, big uh, country. And um, you, you, you may think, well, yeah, but in the past, Bill, like, like they, they hunted down these people here or there. In the past, sure, it did happen. You're absolutely right. Technology is different today. Wills are different today. I, I really don't foresee that. But it is possible. I could be very wrong. Either way, I'm going to take my chances because I'd rather take my chances doing that. Getting off the grid, living out in the middle of nowhere, living in a small community, uh, living a more simple life. I'd rather take my chances with that and raise my children and and my grandchildren, whatever there is to come. And uh, and live a proper life that I, I, I think is right before the Lord then deal with this global technocracy that is just absolutely driven on controlling every aspect of your life. It's absolutely insane, folks. Absolutely insane. But hey, guys, I've gone almost uh, an, an hour and 15 minutes. So I think that's a good place to wrap it up, right? Um, thank you for watching and bearing with me. Please go check out the locals, the rumbles, the peer tube. Go look at the bit shoot. All links will be in the description. Realize I have a live show, The Ends Justify the Memes. Uh, that's every Wednesday at 7 p.m. I have a producer and co-host that helps me do that. We are on DLive and YouTube. Uh, we have been trying to be guest heavy uh, with that. Scheduling sometimes doesn't work out. I've had one guest, uh, Kit Cope. has failed on us twice now. Supposed to be with us at the end of the month. But I know Kit. I have his number. So he should be on at one point or another things happen, right? Such as life improvise, overcome and adapt. But with all that friends, thank you for watching and, uh, keep these things in mind. I will be back on Monday as I make content Monday through Friday and have my weekends off because yes, folks, I do have a life outside of YouTube with all that said, my friends, you all be well.